Hello and welcome to the channel. My name is Josh and you're watching our history. Today we're going over the life of Kachwayo, who was the last Zulu king before the British annexation of the Zululand into the British Empire. So if you enjoy this, please be sure to like and if you're new here, consider smashing the subscribe button. If this isn't your first radio and you haven't shown some love to that subscribe, now is your opportunity. Thank you for watching. Kachwayo Kachwayo Kampande also known as Tkatawayo, was the king of the Zulu kingdom from 1873 to 1879. He held the position of commander-in-chief during the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879. Despite his efforts to make peace with the British, Kachwayo's opposition to the war was in vain. As a result of the Zulu defeat, he was defeated and exiled. However, Kachwayo was later allowed to return to Zululand, where he passed away in 1884. Throughout his reign and subsequent exile, Kachwayo played a significant role in the history of the Zulu Kingdom and the struggle against British colonialism. Early Life Kachwayo was a prominent figure in the Zulu history. He was the son of the Zulu King Mpande and Queen Gumbazi. He was the half-nephew of the Zulu King Shaka and the grandson of Senza Gakona. In 1856, Kachwayo achieved a significant victory at the Battle of Dondokasuka, where he defeated and killed his younger brother Mbuyazi, who was his father's favorite. This battle resulted in the massacre of most of Mbuyazi's followers, including five of Kachwayo's own brothers. Despite not ascending to the throne, as his father was still alive, Kachwayo effectively ruled the Zulu people. Historical accounts describe him as a man of imposing stature, standing between 6 foot 6 and 6 foot 8 inches tall and weighing around 25 stone. Kachwayo, the Zulu king, was wary of potential rivals within his own family. One such rival was his brother Untonga. To safeguard his position, Kachwayo closely monitored his father's new wives and children as they could potentially pose a threat. In 1861, Kachwayo ordered the death of his new favorite wife, Nomanchali, and her children, fearing they could be used against him. Although two sons managed to escape, the youngest was killed in front of the king. These events led Umtonga to seek refuge with the Burj across the border, prompting Kachwayo to negotiate with the Burj to bring him back. In 1865, Umtonga fled once again, causing Kachwayo to believe that he was seeking help from the Burj to overthrow him, similar to how his father had been overthrown by Dingane. Kachwayo indeed faced challenges from his half-brother, Uhamu Kanzibe. Uhamu proved to be a rival who repeatedly betrayed the Zulu cause. His actions included undermining Kachwayo's authority, providing support to rival factions, and engaging in diplomatic interactions with the Zulu adversaries. Uhamu's betrayal eventually weakened Kachwayo's position, contributing to the decline of the Zulu kingdom and its subsequent incorporation into the British colonial rule. Reign. Mpande passed away on 1872, and initially his death was kept a secret to ensure smooth transition of power. On the 1st of September 1873, Kachwaya was crowned as the new king with the assistance of Sir Theopolis Shepston. However, this crowning ceremony was said to be poorly arranged and marred by unfavorable circumstances. Shepston, who had previously integrated the Transvaal into the Cape Colony, eventually turned against the Zulus. He felt undermined by Kachwaya's astute negotiations for land and compromised by encroaching Burj. Furthermore, a boundary commission appointed to settle land ownership disputes ruled in favor of the Zulus, leading to the suppression of that report. After being crowned king, Kachwayo followed the customary practice of establishing a new capital for his nation, which he named Ulundi. In order to strengthen his military power, he expanded his army and reintroduced several strategies originally employed by Shaka, the renowned Zulu leader. Notably, Kachwayo armed his MPs with muskets, although there is a limited evidence of their utilization in battles. Furthermore, Kachwayo expelled European missionaries from his domain, showing his resistance to their presence. It is also suggested that he possibly encouraged other native African groups to challenge the Burj in the Transvaal region. Anglo-Zulu War In 1878, Sir Henry Bartle Freire, the British High Commissioner for the Cape Colony, aimed to unite the colony similar to Canada, but believed it couldn't happen with a strong Zulu state nearby. To provoke the Zulu king, Kachwayo, 
Freire demanded reparations for border infractions and instructed his subordinates to send messages criticizing Quechua's policies. However, Quechua remained composed, seeing the British as allies and recognizing the might of the British army. He asserted that he and Freire were equals and expected the same respect from Freire regarding Zululand as he had shown towards the Cape Colony. In 1879, Quechua, faced with an ultimatum from Sir Bartle Freire, demanding the disbandment of the Zulu army, Quechua's refusal resulted in a war between the Zulu Kingdom and the British Empire. The war began with the Zulu's decisive victory at Isiltuana, where the British suffered heavy casualties. The British columns that had launched a three-pronged attack also faced setbacks, including a siege and two further defeats. However, the British managed to prevent a complete collapse of their military positions with victories at Walks Drift and Kambula. During the retreat, Quechuao decided not to launch a counterattack deep into the Natal. Instead, his primary goal was to repel the ongoing British offensive and establish a peace treaty. However, a Dutch trader named Cornelius Vin, who had been imprisoned by Quechuao at the beginning of the war, acted as his translator and provided information to the British commander, Chelmsford. Vin warned Chelmsford about the increasing gathering of Zulu forces amid the ongoing negotiations. The British made a strategic comeback in Zululand, returning with a larger and better equipped military force. They successfully captured the Zulu capital, Ulundi, in a battle that showcased their improved tactics. Learning from their previous defeat at Isiljuana, the British formed a hollow square formation in an open plain armed with cannons and gatling guns. After approximately 45 minutes of combat, the British cavalry charged the Zulus, leading to their retreat. Following the capture of Ulundi, the Zulu king Quechua was overthrown and sent into exile, first in Cape Town and later in London. Quechua eventually returned to Zululand in 1883. After his exile in 1881, Quechua garnered support for his cause from various individuals, including Lady Florence Dixie, a correspondence for the Morning Post. Lady Dixie actively wrote articles and books advocating for Quechua, which resonated with the public and stirred sympathy towards him. Quechua's gentle and dignified demeanor further enhanced the sentiment, reinforcing the belief that he had been unjustly treated by British officials Bartle Freire and Lord Chelmsford later life. In 1882, a conflict between two Zulu factions, namely the pro Quechua Usutus and a group led by Zibebu, escalated into a violent feud and civil war. Seeking to reinstate Quechua as the ruler of the portion of his previous territory, the British government intervened in 1883, but their efforts proved unsuccessful. Zibebu, supported by Boer mercenaries, initiated a war to challenge the succession. On the 22nd of July 1883, he launched an attack on Quechua's newly established kraal at Ulundi. Although Quechua sustained injuries, he managed to escape to the forest at Nkanja. Quechua relocated to Eshowe following the appeals of Sir Melmoth Osborne, the resident commissioner. Unfortunately, Quechua passed away a few months later, on the 8th of February 1884 at the age of between 57 to 60. The cause of death is believed to be a heart attack, although some theories suggest that he may have been poisoned. He was laid to rest in a field near Nkunzane River, south of Eshowe, within view of the forest. The wagon that transported his body to the burial site is placed on his grave and can be seen at Ondini Museum, close to Ulindi. Quechua is widely recognized as the significant figure in South African history due to his role as the final king of the Zulu kingdom. His reign came to an end when his son, Din Zulu, was declared king on the 20th of May 1884 with the assistance of Boer mercenaries. As a testament to Quechua's historical importance is the presence of a blue plaque honoring him at 18 Melbury Road in Kensington. This plaque serves as a commemoration of his legacy and the impact of his rule on the Zulu kingdom and the broader history of South Africa. In popular culture. Quechua, the Zulu king who lived from 1826 to 1884, appears in various works of literature and media. H. Ryder Haggard, a British author, featured him in three adventure novels, The Witch's Head in 1885, Black Heart and White Heart, 1900, and Finished in 1917. Haggard also wrote a non-fiction book entitled 
Ketiwayo and his white neighbors in 1882, in which Ketiwayo is discussed. John Buchan's novel, Prester John, mentions him as well. In O. Henry's short story, A Municipal Report, published in 1910, a character's face is likened to King Ketiwayo. Ketiwayo is also associated with the opera Leo, the Royal Cadet in 1889, and has been portrayed by various actors in films and TV series, including Mongosutu Butelezi in Zulu in 1964, Simon Sabella in Zulu Dawn in 1979, and Siko Simbone Kuberka in Shaka Zulu in 1986. Legacy The King Kachwayo District Municipality was named after King Kachwayo Kampande. The municipality is located in the KwaZulu Natal province of South Africa. It covers an area of approximately 5,575 square kilometers and is home to a population of around 900,000 people. The district municipality is responsible for providing various essential services to its residents, including water and sanitation, roads, housing, and healthcare. It plays a significant role in promoting the development and improving the quality of life for the community within its jurisdiction. If you enjoy this channel and you would like to support the creation of more content like this because all contributions are greatly appreciated, please check out the Patreon link in the description below.